100, 200, that's what we'll do. Gaelic football. <laughs> Have you heard of Gaelic football? <laughs> it's uh, no. rugby, soccer, Aussie rules football. No, it's all the football yeah, put together. It's oh, it's very big in Ireland.
did you do this? What? When did you do this? Do these these photos? Last the last couple of years. When did I do what? Oh, I thought you, the description said. and everyone has lots of work to do, so we appreciate you making it out. Um, I'm here to introduce Mike Sell. Uh, he was born in Detroit and is currently an Associate Professor of Art at Eastern Oregon University. He is a member of the Society for Photographic Education and the Popular Culture Association. Um, and his artwork and research investigates uh, mimetics and digital analog aesthetic and media-centric constructed imagery. His photography has been exhibited throughout Michigan, Oregon, and select shows in Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, and Europe. Uh, he has presented research at SPE Northwest Conferences in Portland and Eugene, as well as Popular Culture Association conferences in Seattle, Chicago, and Washington, DC. In 2014, uh, he was an invited speaker and artist at the uh, Pusipay Gallery in Estonia, um, for which he received a grant from the Oregon Arts Commission. Um, Sel is also a chair of the Union County Cultural Coalition, a partner with Oregon Cultural Trust. Uh, in April next year, he will present a version of this talk at PCA National Conference in Washington, DC. So thank you all for coming. I'll turn it over. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Oh. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks to, again to Jen and Rhonda for helping coordinate a time for this presentation in the middle of my busy schedule and everyone else's busy schedule. And thanks to MJ for the publicity and all the help in getting all of this together and informing me about how wonderful this new space is. I really like this uh, a lot. Um, <clears throat> my talk today, uh, and if I, if I stutter or cough or anything, I'm getting over the tail end of a cold and I think that I got it beat, but it is a little um, unnerving, so bear with me. Uh, my talk today is going to be about me, uh, my art, the artwork I create, and the band Fish. A lot of you know uh, who I am and how I got here and my particular journey, especially if you have been in a uni class in the last three or four years, because I've consistently been telling all of those incoming students my ridiculous story about getting to La Grande from Michigan. Uh, but a quick review, uh, just in case, before we talk about the real meat of this presentation. Should we, t can we turn the lights yeah, down a little bit? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can still see. Uh, <clears throat> I was born in Michigan to two blue collar parents. Uh, they lived in the same house. Uh, there is Michigan right there. That's where I live. I won't bear with. I won't uh, point to my hand to show you where I live. They lived in the same house for over 30 years, working the same jobs. Uh, my dad in the power plant and my mom in a hospital uh, for even longer than that. Uh, I attended school in Michigan uh, from elementary school. Go Pioneers! Through undergrad, go Bulldogs! Uh, and graduate school, go Color Wheels. We actually weren't the Color Wheels. That we didn't have any sports teams. <laughs> That's what we joked our, t our mascot would have been, because it was an art school. Uh, I'll safely assume that most of you, uh, or many of you, know more about me than you do about the band Fish. Or if you do know who Fish is, uh, you'd probably rather admit that you know more about maybe anything else than you do about the band Fish. Fish is a rock band, in so many words. They formed in Vermont in the early 1980s. Uh, since their inception, they've played thousands of concerts throughout the United States, Japan and Europe, and they have such a large following that they've put on 10 successful fish-centered festivals 
uh, three-day events where the only performer uh, uh, at the time is fish, um, where people will camp and live in this little commune of 30 to 60,000 people um, seeing a show every night for three consecutive nights with vendors that are fish specific and, uh, and events and art projects and all sorts of weird things. Oh, this is the map. This is the camping map from, the, from one of the last uh, festivals, which I thought was really interesting. And in 2017, they played 13 consecutive shows over three weeks in the summer uh, at New York's legendary Madison Square Garden. <clears throat> Excuse me. The band has accomplished all of this without any traditional commercial uh, success or mainstream exposure. Three of their studio albums uh, have cracked the top 10 on Billboard charts, but all three records fell off the top 200 in only uh, a few weeks, uh, the longest lasting about five weeks on the top 200. Fish's staying power is kind of remarkable despite this lack of commercial popularity. Their 2017 tour ranked 24th nationally, averaging over 30,000 fans per show, grossing about a million and a half dollars per show, and playing to almost three quarters of a million fans over the course of 42 shows in 22 cities. By comparison, oh, and I forgot to add a slide. Uh, by comparison, Bruce Springsteen's 27 tour, which was ranked sixth nationally, grossed nearly twice as much money per show as Fish, with ticket prices that were more than three times the average cost. I was first exposed to the band Fish in high school, go Saints, by a stereotypical 1990s stoner, pseudo, hippie kind of kid. If you're about my age and you weren't one of those kids, you probably went to school with a kid like that. Uh, he uh, thought it was hilarious, and maybe he thought it was interesting, but he mostly hilarious. Uh, that a band would release a 36-minute version of a song on CD, and this is what he had playing in the computer in computer class, where we were supposed to be learning how to use Microsoft Publisher or some other software that nobody uses anymore because it was the 90s and all that stuff is obsolete. He felt compelled to tell me, dude, you've got to hear this. And we made it about two minutes in before the teacher probably told us to turn it off because it was disrupting the class or we were supposed to be focusing on, on something else. In the end, though, that wasn't really my thing. Um, it just didn't appeal to me, and I didn't really think anything of it. In high school, my plan was to attend college and become a doctor. It wasn't until my first drawing classes that I seriously considered majoring in art. I'd been making art all of my life, um, and much of that work revolved around people and music, and I never really fully realized this until recently, uh, a month or two ago, I was putting together a similar talk where I was trying to kind of piece together my entire creative process from like birth until now. And, and I kept coming back to these recent images that we'll look at in a little bit and images and work that I had made when I was much, much younger and how music kind of played a part in, in all of this. I've always been interested in music, uh, beginning with, likely beginning with, with my fascination my parents' record collection. Uh, we had cassette tapes in our cars, but seeing Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, which was my favorite as a kid, and one of the very few cool records that my parents happened to hang on to uh, in their later years. Where's all the Stones records? Oh, I don't listen to them anymore. Okay. Uh, but li looking at this and listening to this on vinyl was really something to behold. At 10 years old, I didn't understand the impact that this music would have had in the contemporary society of 1968, uh, but I knew that the entire package, the design, the photographs, the drawings, the sleeve, the most records at the time in the 60s would have ads for all the other records you could buy, but Sgt. Pepper's had this like pink and purple wavy, it was just this psychedelic design and you pulled it out and the thing is like bigger than your face. Um, and paper cutouts paper cutouts uh, really caught my attention. It was, so, it was so weird. I didn't get it at all, but I knew that I liked it. Flashing forward three or four years, my liking to music or liking of music explodes into love. I start playing guitar, collecting CDs, and a friend and I created a fictional rock band named OK, <laughs> where I was able to exercise my creative outlet by making fictional albums, uh, getting CDs, they were usually America Online sample CDs that they would send you in the mail. 
So every couple of months, a new CD would show up in the mail, and oh, I've got an idea, and I would turn that into a new project. Uh, this was all accompanied by uh, scrapbooks that I kept, which would catalog images, lyrics, designs, and all these inside jokes. Basically, a, a three or four year record of my friendship with my, my best friend in middle school and part of high school, where this is all we did, was pretend we were in a band. And these are two songs that he wrote that aren't real songs, but they have words. They don't have, they don't have music. Additionally, uh, I used my parents' video camera to create documentaries that focused on my friends who were in a real rock band, uh, following them around and making sort of pseudo uh, uh, mockumentaries in the Spinal Tap style, only it was real. Um, recording the shows that they performed and their hijinks behind the scenes. Uh, the films never saw widespread commercial release, believe it or not. Uh, though I do have, I do have old VHS copies if anybody is interested and can scrounge up a functioning uh, VCR. If you want to, uh, you can send a tech, tic tech ticket to Gib and he'll get started uh, on, maybe we can have a viewing party in this room. It's humongous. It would be, that'd be really fun and really strange uh, and probably really embarrassing. <laughs> Uh, everything I had ever done that related to music, however, was through imitation. And this is an important theme that kind of runs throughout the course of this talk and kind of everything that I've ever made, ever. I was copying what I saw around me and all the songs I knew how to play on guitar were always other people's songs. And everything that revolved around this fake band was all kind of a parody of other things that we knew about because it added legitimacy to what we were making by referencing this thing that was already legitimized in everyday society. By the time I got to college and I entered a BFA program, um, I found other artists and techniques that I could appropriate and copy, uh, namely in uh, f early Photo One portraits uh, when I discovered the photography of Richard Avedon, who's still one of my all-time favorites. And uh, one of my first projects was to create photos in that style and that's, that sort of methodology has kind of stuck with me ever since. These images were students who worked in the art studios uh, and were my first attempts at connecting with people that I didn't entirely know through photography. And, and they were also uh, my first attempts at making one thing that was actually something else. Um, technically, these images that Avedon shot were on an 8x10 camera, so he was shooting film negatives that are about as big as this piece of paper, and printing these negatives gives you this distinct black border around the edges. But that's a very advanced type of photography. That's a photo two, photo three kind of thing. And in beginning photography, we only had 35 millimeter film. And so I made, I made a stencil so that I could print my 35 millimeter images as though they looked like four by five images or eight by 10 images. And I remember it really frustrating my photo professor because he thought that that was an inordinate amount of work to, to mimic this photography. And it impressed the students who were in photo two who were a year ahead of me. And I thought that I was like really special. Like I got their attention. Um, I continued shooting portraits when I got to graduate school, including a series of images featuring pastors, reverends, and rabbis. I spent a decent amount of grad school on this religious kick which I think a lot of artists kind of do, at least at some point in their career, because you have to grapple with that kind of thing. Uh, maybe it was because I was raised Catholic uh, that you kind of have to really dig deep and find out what that stuff is about. Uh, these color environmental portraits were explorations of community and stature, um, examining the role of male leadership in religious communities. My MFA thesis work was also portrait focused, though mostly environmental, as I depicted a fictional presidential candidate and his unsuccessful bid for the office in uh, the 2008 election. The entire project relied on viewers' trust in replicated media uh, that the, through familiar communication tools an artist could present a fictional scenario as real. Um, the imitation was close enough to the real thing that the resulting work, in a way, became real in and of itself. Uh, so this, was entire, this project was entirely staged with this uh, guy who eventually became my friend, uh, but I found him by searching for act people who, in the area who were actors on MySpace. Uh, because when I started grad school, MySpace was also still a thing. The final, the final exhibition was presented like a historical display with framed pieces and info cards and a display case featuring the artifacts of the campaign. 
Uh, that tie is the tie that he had on his head on the, on the Rolling Stone cover. After I moved to Legrand in 2011, I completed a series of portraits that focused on members of an online message board or forum as a way to investigate identity, both real and constructed, on how, and how strangers interact with each other online. It should be noted that I first fell into this group of anonymous rascals uh, because the internet message board itself that I discovered in the early 2000s in my undergraduate days was focused on the Dave Matthews Band, which was a band I fell in love with way back then. Uh, by 2011, most of us had moved away from that group, and, uh, but the community remained intact, and people, was, people were, were still participating in this online forum. I had never met any of these people before, and I barely even knew their real names, but they came out of the woodwork to volunteer to be photographed. My interactions with all of them were welcoming and familiar, uh, like we were already old friends. I traveled and photographed throughout Washington and Oregon and did a big loop through the Midwest, starting in Michigan, my hometown, and looping through Chicago, down through Tennessee, and back up through DC and Philadelphia. Everybody in this group was really cordial, enthusiastic about the project and our discussions. Uh, I even had lunch with one of the photo subjects after we had our photo session. I had never met him, and it was lunchtime, and he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going back home, and he said, let's get lunch. And we would chat about what it meant to belong in this online community. And these were all people, I realized, who had spent all of this time online, and they sort of spoke like they were media scholars because they understood their place in the community and they understood what they were doing. And I think that that grew out of being of a generation that wasn't born with the internet, um, where we were, we're all almost the same age and it wasn't until we were in our teens or 20s when the connectivity that we have now became this ubiquitous thing. And so we, everybody had this awareness, which I thought was really interesting and kind of enlightening that people understood and acknowledged that their interactions online and how they presented themselves weren't always the real them. And they had this really eloquent way of talking about what the real version of them was, and I thought that that was really fantastic. In a lot of this work, I was examining these people as well as their personalities, exploring what makes a person who they are by representing them honestly in an image. <clears throat> I took on the role, as Susan Sontag describes, of a scientist rather than a moralist. She has this, uh, this spectrum of photographers, and scientific photography is on one side and moral photography is on the other side. Uh, according to Sontag, uh, scientist photographers take an inventory of the world. In On Photography, her seminal book that she wrote, these essays um, about photography, she references German photographer August Sander as the epitome of scientist photographer creating a catalog through portraiture. Um, August Sander grew up or sort of um, came to the apex of his career at the height of the Third Reich as he was making this um, catalog, sort of making this catalog of German archetypes, like each sort of, the, the image here on the left is pastry chef. And so that was his attempt at sort of summarizing what it meant to be a pastry chef in Germany. And that would be the photo that represented um, uh, pastry chefs in all of his catalogs. And he had this plan for this 13 volume set of all of these catalog photographs. And the, as the Nazis came to power, they liked that idea because he was idealizing these sort of German archetypes. And he would say, and he went, uh, no, 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 that's, that's not what I'm doing. I'm doing that because of this like connection to humanity and these different types of people and how we all contribute. And they said, well, we want you to do this. And he said, no, thank you. And he left. Uh, but many of the, the images that I was making about community have something less tangible or documentable of, about how members of a specific group are individuals as well as parts of a collective, similar to what uh, Sander was doing in the 30s. I first photographed fish fans at the Gorge Amphitheater in 2016, uh, prior to their two-night stand at the venue in July of that year. Uh, this is the Gorge, for those of you who have never been there before. Uh, you have to go. Like, you don't, I don't care if it's fish. You've got to see, you see the Gorge. You've got to see the Gorge. Um, uh, <laughs> oh, now I lost my place because I was 
extemporaneously ad-libbing about how wonderful it is. I had been to the venue before, one time, and I knew the layout and the logistics, and this very basic plan of setting up shop in the parking lot with a tripod and a white sheet hung from the back of the car, and, and just getting people's attention, and let's make some pictures. And I had no idea how it was going to work. Uh, I'd been to many concerts leading up to this, but I had never considered interacting with people uh, that I didn't know in this manner at all. But the project forced that mode of operation onto me, and the large format camera was a good icebreaker because, uh, excuse me, when it came to people simply wandering by. It's an old camera, it's made of wood, the bellows, the accordion shape that connects the front and the back are red, and, and it's sitting in this parking lot where all these people are tailgating, and I'm just sitting there waiting for people to come by, and it's this sort of conversation piece. Like, what the heck is that? Oh, it's a camera, how old is it? I don't really know. Why don't you sit down and I'll tell you about my camera while I take your picture. Uh, from past projects, everything was very organized and planned, especially with my MFA shoots and undergraduate stuff with all these conceptual ideas driving everything. Um, and I had contacted potential subjects and planned these routes and we made arrangements and shot portraits. But in a way then, these portraits are about me. The fake band that I dreamed up with a friend 25 years ago was this outlet to create public material without having to do anything publicly. Um, the OK CDs and music were about this insecurity and introvertedness that has followed me to some degree ever since seventh or eighth grade or probably even earlier. These portraits then become an exercise in addressing those insecurities through an engagement with strangers. The camera is how I construct my personality. Hey, I'm at a fish show. Who are you? Oh, I'm the guy who takes pictures. Oh yeah, let's take a picture. Um, it was a really easy way to enter into this process and engage with people that I otherwise wouldn't engage with in this way. And throwing photography and fish into the same pot, so to speak, um, two things that I can talk about with most people at length, um, if you need to, I can talk to you about those things. Uh, into the mix helped quell most of my anxiety that a project like this would fall flat or that I wouldn't get any good images out of the effort. I was comfortable with the subjects in front of me, fish and the people who see the band. Uh, this also made the project work more smoothly as the crowds are usually open to interaction and invitation to engage with people they didn't know, especially when they're out in the sunshine in Washington in the summertime and they're walking around and they probably have a beer in their hand. When the purpose of gathering is a concert by a band that everybody likes, it brings out this camaraderie similar to a political rally or a religious ceremony or something like that. But these images are about photography, because photography is always about photography. Photography is a medium that's unique in its ability to reproduce and copy the world around us in a relatively objective manner. We won't get into the argument of objective versus subjective just yet, or at all, uh, but we can do that later as well. Walter Benjamin wrote about photography in his seminal essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction which was a groundbreaking Marxist work in which Benjamin described the diminishing aura of artwork as reproducibility became more common. For him, the notion that art could be copied was a vital Marxist ideal. It hastened the democratization of art, spreading art to the masses as opposed to, excuse me, as opposed to only having been a pursuit and passion of the bourgeoisie. The copying of art was Benjamin's rallying cry for Marxism, and the photograph was the central technological focus of his essay. That in short, he was saying that works of art would no longer remain special because photographs could now reproduce those works of art and you wouldn't have to go somewhere to see them. And he thought that was both good because it lowered high art to be disseminated to the masses, but also bad because it diminished the vital role that art had in our society. Art critic Rosalind Krauss took Benjamin's idea even further, saying the practice of duplication eroded the division between the copy and its original. At the heart of Krauss's argument is the metaphor of the copied image, and she cites a situation in which she witnessed hundreds of Japanese tourists photographing the same beautiful woman on a beach, and she came up with this notion of the false copy, that as all the cameras were pointed at the same subject, it takes the idea of difference or non-resemblance and internalizes it, setting it up with the given objects as its very condition of being. This is similar to Roland Barthes and his sweeping generalization that people in real form or captured within photographs are nothing more than copies of copies, either real or mental. Mental copies, that is. 
contemporary society grapples with this notion of originality and authorship, when arguments arise regarding living in the moment or simply paying attention when people take more care to photograph moments than to experience them. And this is an argument we get into in digital photography all the time. That it's starting to drive me crazy. Um, the aura of our experiences, not just our art, is diminished uh, when we take the time to reproduce these experiences or moments, usually through photography or video. Um, and I don't think this is a fish show, but it looked enough like one that I was like, I can use that picture. This is what makes fish an interesting topic of discussion and investigation when it comes to replication. And as a subject for photography, albeit a slightly sideways connection when it comes to my work. Part of what I enjoy about making this work, these are two more images from 2016 at the Gorge, is the connections that I make with these subjects in the images. Everyone has a different history and story about the band, and everyone engages with me a different, in a different way. Some people asking what I'll do with the images, some people asking me about the process, some people asking me about my history, other people I photographed, or whatever. Uh, and everyone at a fish show engages with the band in a different way as well, connecting in ways that relate to sight, sound, or emotion. The photographs then, these resulting portraits, are copies of those people and their story. Barth said that people only look like photographs of themselves, and that we are all nothing more than a copy of a copy on to infinity. And being a portrait photographer reinforces that idea of copying copies over and over again. In fact, being any kind of artist kind of does that, because you get in the routine and you are doing the same thing over and over again. Maybe not painting the same paintings over and over again, but the process becomes the same over and over again. Being a musician is like that as well. A band is usually just performing the same songs over and over again in different places to different groups of people, except with fish. And this is what you would hear in conversation with the subjects of these images, because they're different. Just as no two fish fans are alike, like Melissa here on the right from Portland, and Mark on the left from Massachusetts. It was his first time out west, and his first time seeing fish at the gorge. He was very excited, even though he doesn't look excited in the picture. Uh, he, um, uh, he was super stoic, and then when I emailed him a scan of the image, his email was like a written version of him flipping out. He used so many exclamation points. He was so excited. It was so weird that he was the person emailing me back. Um, I, thought that, I thought that was really strange. Um, just as no two fish fans are alike, no two fish shows are alike, nor are two versions of the same song at a fish show alike. And this keeps fans, like these people, striving to see more concerts and to hear more songs, to finally get the rare song as though they own the song or possess the song. Like, oh, I finally got it after 42 shows or 78 shows. Or when I was in New York, I photographed a guy who was, that, was, that night was his 100th show. Uh, fish is essentially a unique mimetic machine or replicator. Most people, because of the internet, are aware of what memes are. During my first colloquium presentation in 2011, I can't believe it was seven years ago, I spent the first 34 slides of the talk explaining what memes were because almost nobody knew what I was talking about. Within two years, students were using that term regularly and usually only to describe things that they had seen on the internet. Since then, though, I think people have lost sight of the scope of what a meme actually is or what memetics is, the study of memes. So a brief review is in order. Uh, the concept of the meme was coined in the 1970s by evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins and since has been taken up by mem memeticists like Susan Blackmore and Daniel Dennett. Memes are all elements of human culture that are replicated through imitation, including language, music, fashion, religion, and even cooking. However, human imitation is less and less critical for mimetic replication as the internet and other technical devices act more like distribution systems for memes. So instead of me having to see someone cook something, like in my family, I can watch a video online of someone else doing that. And that's how that meme of sauteing these mushrooms and asparagus or whatever the heck it is um, gets passed from person to person. Even sticker art or street art isn't entirely dependent on imitation to succeed because it's just a thing and now it's there and, oh, I saw that thing there, and then you see it in Portland and you see it in Chicago. As the internet becomes a simulation of reality when compared to physical reality, the replication mechanism for memes, particularly visual images on the internet, become increasingly complicated. And this is uh, an image from graduate school that got me into, uh, in a new visual studies class, I did an entire uh, semester basically studying internet memes. It was when cats were the thing and it was studying the lol cats. I think we talked about that essay 
Yeah. Did I give it to you? No. Oh, I didn't? Oh, I still I meant to share it on Drive. Anyway, uh, copying is what allows memes to exist and pass from person to person. Knowledge, language, stories, songs, everything that we can pass along through imitation is a meme. Even the words I'm saying, you understand them because of memetic replication. It's part of our culture that we understand English. Like Susan Blackmore saying that the internet was created in order to spread memes, the obsession of a fish fan has connections to memetics as well. It's part of what is driving my talk today. I want to spread fish to all of you because you'll be better off, maybe. Uh, the subjects of my photographs want to talk about fish as well. They want this thing, these ideas, songs, music, jokes, memories, histories, to live on by passing it from person to person. The thing is, is that the meme is what's driving this idea. The meme, like a virus or a gene, is meant to be replicated. Fish is just the perfect vehicle for fish-generated memes. And a band like Fish has memes all over the place. Fish-centric festivals with 50,000 people living together, that is just meme heaven. Every Fish show is swimming in memes, from the parking lot where people sell bootleg t-shirts that mimic and rip off well-known logos like Pepsi and Corona beer, um, to the 1960s culture that still perpetuates the, the average Fish fan, people wearing bell-bottoms and dreadlocks and tie-dye, Shakedown Street, which started with people selling their crappy stuff at Grateful Dead shows so they can make enough money just to go to the next Grateful Dead show, that's here too. Um, these are images from this past summer at Shakedown Street. Um, there's even a, uh, a Trailblazers meme uh, jersey that references a fish song in there as well. <clears throat> every band, every artist, or every creator is intentionally or not creating memes. Creative types contribute memes to the world as developers of culture. And then there's the music itself. With every live version of a song sounding different, Fish has developed a culture of fans obsessed with specific memes. Fish plays music in a broad range of styles and genres, from rock to funk to bluegrass, uh, prog, fusion, and jazz, and even barbershop, quartet, and a cappella songs. Their set lists are mostly unscripted, unplanned, and most of their performances consi consist of composed songs that feature prominent improvised sections, resulting in unique memes being churned out night after night from performance to performance. Additionally, a reasonable portion of Fish's musical repertoire consists of cover songs. An average white band from Vermont had to get its start playing cover somewhere, right? Playing cover songs, though, gives Fish a unique ad advantage over other groups that traditionally shrug off playing cover songs. Uh, because, as a band playing prog, rock, jazz, improv, cover songs can act as a foothold for new fans to discover the music of Fish because they hear them playing another song that they're familiar with. That's part of what interested me in the band um, during my undergraduate days when we had Napster. And you could look up, I do want to hear Fish playing uh, 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 Tumbling Dice by the Rolling Stones. I know that song. Hey, here's these guys covering it. What else do they play? Um, if they play a Stones song or a Beatles tune, then I'm more likely to develop an interest in their other material because if I like what I hear, then I want to hear more. Fish has a tradition of playing Halloween concerts with a middle chunk of each show dedicated to covering another band's material. Dubbed a musical costume, Fish has performed entire albums by The Beatles, Talking Heads, Velvet Underground, David Bowie, and Little Feet, to name a few. In each instance, Fish spread other bands' memes to new audiences while per perpetuating their own memes, their mythology, and their stronghold in the culture of their fan base. Uh, Fish's Halloween meme came full circle for me just last week, and Jason is here uh, in the front row, and we watched this show together, so I apologize for embarrassing you. Instead of covering another group's music, they invented a fictional Scandinavian band and covered that band's music in the middle of their set. What started as a joke with my friend in middle school of dreaming of having this fake rock band, last week I was watching one of my favorite bands essentially live out the dreams of 12-year-old me by pretending, they were pretending to be this other group. It was completely, it was completely made up. Um, fictional music goes mainstream. It was right in front of my eyes and it was a strange and delightful experience. Uh, I received an EOU uh, summer stipend in 2017 that allowed me to travel to New York and take portraits uh, before one of those 13 uh, Baker's Dozen shows at Madison Square Garden. My photo sessions took place at an event called Fan Art, which was hosted by a hotel across the street from Madison Square Garden, uh, where artisans and artists who create work that is only about the band Fish uh, 
can get together and it's kind of a little marketplace and I had a little booth in the corner to take pictures. Uh, you can buy anything there from limited edition screen prints, um, drawings, photographs, but also like can koozies and welcome mats that have fish lyrics and stuff on them. Um, jewelry, clothes, t-shirts, hammocks. The guy next to me was selling fish hammocks. Um, uh, and um, artisans and artists using the memes of fish to, in order to spread their own memes, copying copies of memes, like Barth says, on into infinity. In editing these New York images for the upcoming faculty show that opens tomorrow at 6 p.m. in the Nightingale Gallery, and you should all go and see the work that uh, my wonderful colleagues have created, I developed a slight appreciation for this aesthetic of images that were lit artificially. Um, I was really disappointed in how these images turned out when I started developing them last summer, and uh, only by editing them this summer with images from this year as well, I kind of grew comfortable with the, the look of these photos because you can tell they're inside, indoors. But those concerts were inside and indoors, and that's a different experience than being out in the open air, especially at a place like the Gorge. And these are two other images from that session. This past summer, I went back to the Gorge and repeated this routine. The color images from a few slides ago were taken while wandering around the expansive campground lot. Uh, this doesn't even show the venue. It's off on the right, I think. It's over there somewhere. It's on the fancy smart board somewhere. Um, and uh, I even saw some of the same people from previous years and was able to photograph them again. This is Megan, uh, who in 2016 camped on the campsite next to me at our campground and I photographed her the next day at one of the shows. And then this past summer, she and her husband showed up and parked right behind me and rushed over like I was a long lost friend. Uh, they told me this story that they had used the photos when, when I met them two years ago, they were boyfriend and girlfriend, and they had gotten married in the past two years, and they used my photos on their like, in their ceremony and at their reception and on their thank you notes and stuff. And they were just thrilled to see me and they couldn't wait to have their picture taken again. And they were both wearing the same clothes that they wore the two years before on the day that I took their picture. Like he was wearing a shirt that had Winnie the Pooh on it or something. And it was the exact same, exact same thing. Uh, <clears throat> oh, where was I? In these interactions, I come to realize uh, that I knew these people and remembered them through their images. Oh, because people that I were, was meeting for a second time couldn't believe that I remembered who they were. And I wanted to tell them, I took your picture and I spent like seven hours staring at it while I like cleaned it up and resized it and tinted it and printed it and framed it and displayed it. And it's like, how wouldn't I know what your name was? Um, as, par as a part of fish culture, the people in the photos are memes also, and I'm serving to preserve their memory. Their copies, they are the copies that I make. They are proof, as Barth said, of that which has been, something that exists in the past. They're evidence of the fan's existence and a captured memory that predicts the death of their subject. But running counter to that is the life that the images illustrate of the usually unseen side of being in a rock and roll band, and that is the fans. Um, we don't see these faces at concerts because we're looking one way, and the band is who sees all of these faces looking up at them. <laughs> and these are two more from this past summer. Coming to terms with being a fish fan, it's not something that I was comfortable just floating out there in conversation with most people, and so I'm kind of like coming into my own as being to say, like, Let's face it, when you've seen a band more than 10 times, you kind of have to shrug and say, yeah, that's a part, this is a part of who I am. It's helped me move more confidently in how I approach my photography. Much of the work I talked about today, especially this past work, was always couched in this deep conceptual uh, inception where the idea came first and I had to work around that idea in order to make something that I thought was successful. Um, and Part of that likely grew out of being in an academic environment. When you're in graduate school and you read Walter Benjamin and Roland Barthes and Rosalind Krauss and Susan Sontag, the work you make is driven by that research. But for this work, I have always, I've been for three years now kind of flying by the seat of my pants and whoever wanders past is who I get images of and it's very um, laid back and more casual and that's 
not a way that I've really been used to working in the past, and it's been kind of refreshing to still have to still make successful work that I find really interesting, despite this uh, not growing out of a conceptual idea to begin with. And despite the topic and subject of this most current work being somewhat juvenile, and if you don't believe me, it's pictures of people going to see a band that plays a song called Meat Stick. Really? Meat Stick? It's a song. Uh, I'm even more interested in photos telling a story in this bare bones and modernist way, where it's the black and white faces that look right back at me and confront me in a way that makes me think about what makes me who I am. And like most of us who have been turned on to it, fish is a part of what makes me who I am. Thank you. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and open it up. If people have questions, I'll come bring the mic around. Even the students don't have questions. When <laughs> there we do you go. Get to Thank you, when Nikki. Do you get to do this? <laughs> Will you teach us the process of making um, your 35 millimeter screen so to make it look like it's bigger? I think, I think in my, I think in my studio in my box of work from undergrad, I think it was a piece of mat board that I cut in that shape, and I think I saved that just because. I save lots of things that I shouldn't save. So I may have it, and it's really, you just set it on the 8x10. And you print your picture, and then you cover it, and then you blast the edges with light, and it makes the little black lines. If you, need, if you want to learn how to do that, I can show you that. <laughs> but not so you can skip out on learning how to use the 4x5 for real, because that's not fair. That was really interesting, Mike. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, um, so one of the things that I noticed or noticed a lack of was just diversity in the subjects. And um, I'm familiar with fish and this more in the way you described it as being aware of it, not involved in it. But um, yeah, just comment on that in, in what in that type of way is is that representative of the lack of diversity that's in these shows, and how do you think that affects the experience and how this information translates? Experiences with, do you mean experiences with the show or experiences in my interaction with the people? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> so I was originally thinking, um, like, at the show, what does that make the experience like? If if people are all following this thing they're very comfortable with and they all look very similar yeah. or not very similar, but they're all part of kind of a similar cultural oh, thing, yeah. then um, it's interesting to me that people are going back and back and back for more and more and more, um, even though it, I, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I just want you, I want to hear it's what that, you think about as that. I, that's one thing that just my research hasn't s started to explore um, and, and I talk about it with students as, like you, this idea of um, making art that you know and when it's, no, that's not, that's not the right way to start that answer. Um, if it's, it's hard to confront that because that is who, that's who's there. And, and um, I have other, I do have images of a few people of color um, there are more, I'm probably photographing more male subjects than I am photographing female subjects. Um, I thought that this past summer that the, that the crowd felt more diverse than even my first show was eight years ago in Wisconsin, and it could have been because of that, um, being in the Midwest versus being at shows in New York City. Um, but it's not something that I can make solid counter arguments to because it's a predominantly white crowd. Um, it's pr it's probably not predominantly male, but it's it's not 50-50. It maybe is 60-40, um, and and I don't know how I feel about that. It's it's I can either I can either engage with that and make work that then starts to confront those issues, but I don't have a solid 
I, w I wouldn't immediately have a solid grasp of why I would want to make those images. And that sounds like a cop-out. Like, let someone else investigate the social makeup of, or the demographic of this band that everybody loves or that a lot of people like, not everybody. Um, and it's... It is, it's, it's conflicting, like it really does, it doesn't bother me, um, but it is something that when I keep flipping through, I'm flipping through like now binders and binders of sheets of film and, and like kind of jokingly thinking like, oh, that guy looks different, or oh, look at her, or, uh, but it's not, I, I feel strange then, oh, I have to print that one so that when I exhibit them here or there or whatever, it isn't just a bunch of white faces staring back at us. Um, and I think that that might be, I don't know if an artistic perspective of that is necessary. It might be a, a sociological perspective that yeah, I mean, I makes that more interesting. In, in, terms of, in terms of this insecurity that I have approaching people to, the thing that I tell students about getting out of your comfort zone and like talk to people, if you want to take their picture, like ask them if you can take their picture. And if they say no, then oh well, you move on. Um, but that's not, I, I, I don't have that little voice of my teacher telling me that buzzing in the back of my head. And it, I'm still very restrained and not wanting to like, jump up in in front of someone and when when the row when the train of people walking past your camera uh, is all white then if i if i engage with a person of color i i feel strange not wanting to think that i only want to take their picture so that i can build some diversity into the images that i'm making and that may be that may be completely naive and short sighted because i am just a white man, and that maybe isn't how people think. Um, but as I was putting this together, and I thought, presenting this in an academic environment with colleagues, like it, 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 it begs a really important question. Um, I mean, and it sounds. No. No, I no, I understand that. It is, and it's it's to, that's just that's just how it's been for a long, long time. Um, but it was it was something that I not in terms of taking pictures. It's what I th I did notice the last um, couple of shows that it felt a little bit, a little bit more welcoming and inclusive, or not that it didn't feel inclusive before or welcoming, but that's just kind of something I noticed. Yeah. So, um, do you ever consider going to shoot then? different shows that maybe, oh, sorry. So do you ever go, because like last summer in Pendleton, uh, there was a country pop star, I think by the name of Blake Shelton, uh -huh. and a hip hop pop star by uh -huh. the name of Pitbull uh -huh. that co-headlined a uh -huh. concert that my retired neighbor went to uh -huh. <laughs> from La Grande uh -huh. and like tailgated all weekend with uh -huh. his like this would present some sort of like really interesting dichotomy if yeah f f I don't know setting up shop in one of those places I, w uh, I would and I and as this like it on the heels of this becoming like becoming more engaging and something that I think that I could just keep doing then that's the thing that I have to seek out yeah and and give it a try, yeah. <laughs> you didn't go though. No. I didn't even know what was happening. When you told me about it, I couldn't even understand what it was. I had to like go confirm and make sure it was like an actual thing. I remember seeing the announcement too. I was curious who they were going to get to play, and I saw that pairing, and I thought that that was really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have additional questions? If not, it might open up an opportunity if people want to kind of come and have one-on-one -on -one conversations with sure. you. We have a little Off bit mic. of about five, six minutes before five o'clock, um, so I can kind of turn it over to them. Thank you so much right. for Thanks coming. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate have it. Have a lovely evening.